thank you for coming on this beautiful day. I, I would be having oysters right now across the street if I were you. Um, anyway, um, I'm Kara Swisher. I run a site called Rico, which is a tech site uh, here in San Francisco and do some columns for the New York Times and things. And I write a lot about these issues that Steve has covered. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the book and also about how it relates a little bit because we're in San Francisco to income inequality. Uh, and other issues that are here, UBI and things like that. So I first want to start, Steve, give, give, give everybody a sense of what you were trying to get through with this book, because we are at record unemployment, stock market highs, Almost. the economy is booming. Right. So why would I write a book that can American capitalism survive? Yeah, exactly. So first reason was it wasn't my choice, uh, that's because that's what the publisher wanted to call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's, there's been... Um, sort of an erosion of certain norms mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, laws and regulations that I think in the long run will make our kind of capitalism the kind that people um, won't want to have. And right. so, uh, and if we don't change it, we're going to do less well than some of our economic competitors uh, abroad. All right, so talk about what, how it got into place and what is wrong. The yeah. main things that are wrong, income inequality is one, or, or salary. Let me go back to, okay. th what's wrong is a set of ideas which have, have allowed us to, f to have incomes that become unequal, but you have to go back to the 1980s. I'm blaming um, Milton Friedman, but go ahead, move on. What I blame blaming Milton? Milton? No, I don't think we should blame him. I think we should, what, look, what happened in the 1980s and, um, is that our, our economy became very uncompetitive. This is sort of before much of Silicon Valley, just getting going. Um, our, much of our economy had become uncompetitive, and there was, you know, I don't know whether you remember, but there were these competitiveness commissions, you know, and the, we were falling behind Japan and Germany, um, and, and uh, people wondered whether we were going to become like Britain. Mm -hmm. And we'd gotten fat and happy, and we needed to make some changes, and we needed to become a little more uh, lean and mean. And the cause of that was? Well, the cause of that was globalization, primarily, some tech, but mostly it was globalization. We had a closed economy, and all of a sudden, people were buying foreign cars and, you know, foreign-made everything. Uh, and this was before China, by the way. Mm -hmm. This is Japan. This is uh, uh, the Philippines. That's Korea, that sort of thing. So um, we did some things but, uh, that were necessary, and they worked. But in order to do that, we sort of embrace some ideas. And uh, this is, in some ways, a, a book about ideas. And the ideas we embrace looked like they were good, and they were useful, but they were wrong. And that, what were the ideas? Greed was good, right. that market... The Michael it, Douglas... Well. Yeah, the Michael Douglas thing, but, you know, that the capitalist system works when everyone pursues his own self-interest, maximizes his own income, and as if, by magic, the invisible hand sudden, so, somehow makes us all better off. Uh, the second thing that we embrace is the idea that market incomes, what we earn in the marketplace, was a good objective um, measure of our contribution. And so it was just. And they deserved that. And people shouldn't take it away from them. Um, the third idea um, that we embraced is that there's, that there's some sort of trade-off, that if we made our system fairer um, than it is now, that somehow we'd, we'd make the pie grow smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and another idea, um, well, those are, those are the, the, the three, and uh, uh, it turns out that, that, uh, they're, that they're wrong. Um, that we can't, if you get too greedy, and you, don't, then you stop learning how to cooperate with each other. Mm -hmm. You stop being sympathetic with each other, and companies and, and societies don't work better that way. Um, it turns out that there isn't an absolute trade-off between growth and fairness. There is, you know, if you're on one side of the, the sweet spot, if you're like France and you, you're, you have too much regulation and too much equality, you know, you may, you may have a trade-off. But we're on the other side, and we were on the side where we have so much inequality that it's caused political dysfunction and, and polarization and government dysfunction. Uh, people don't trust each other as much. They don't cooperate as much in the private sector as well as in the public sector. And societies don't work better that way, and, and economies don't work uh, better that way. So. Um, these ideas that, that we embrace, that, uh, for and example, that the market income, well, you know, your market income, that uh, the one I used to like to use, it's not a West Coast example, is an East Coast example, Steve Schwartzman, um, who earned $800 million last year as head of a thing called the Blackstone Group, a mm -hmm. private equity firm. Right. Um, he doesn't deserve $800 million, and the reason he earns $800 million doesn't reflect his economic contribution. All he does is buy and sell companies and, and, and uh, financial assets. 
Um, that's a reflection of a lot of rules and norms and laws uh, that we've set up that structure our economy, and he's the beneficiary of those. Right, of those particular laws. And if we change so those rules, he might only earn $400 million a year. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the idea that... He you know that's not very much here, but go ahead. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, it's like a middle-level Google <laughs> engineer, but go ahead. Anyway, um, these ideas turn out not to be, uh, uh, not to be accurate. But they've and had success from an economic point of view. Like well, they did make our economy much more competitive, and we are a very economy, uh, competitive economy. But what right. I'm suggesting is now we need to make a correction, as we did in, 19, in the mid-1980s. We now need to make a, another correction and let the pendulum swing a little bit back. How can we make an argument when it's never been better? Like it's net we recovered from this. Well, first of all, um, I, I hate to get you know go economist. It's not been better for everybody. I hate everybody. to go right. economist no, I, on you, right. but but productivity growth has been pretty slow for right. the last 18 so years. So has salary growth. In the uh, and so has salary growth. So uh, I'm not sure. I love all those statistics. I, that I agree with them all or that they're all that accurate. But over the long term, um, there's something going on that isn't all that positive. And the fact that the inequality is so much is one indication. Another indication is a lot of Look, if, you, if you're a country that borrows $750 billion a year from the rest of the, from the, rest of, of the world mm -hmm. in order to increase your consumption, not your investment, but your consumption, which right. is what we do, and we do it year after year after year, you can have a pretty good uh, economy going, but it's fake. Right. It's a mirage. Right. Uh, you can't keep doing that forever, and uh, we get all these bubbles. We had a bubbles in the in the 80s, SNL. Uh, uh, we had the tech and telecom in t 2000. We also had the Asian financial crisis, and we had 2008. Each of these is a bubble, and then it bursts, and then a bubble, and it bursts. And when it when the bubble is 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 full, the economy looks great. Mm -hmm. And then when it bursts, everyone realizes that it was a mirage. Right, right. Um, so, so we're not doing as well as we think we are. As we think we are. Right now, right. we're not. And this one's going to burst too. Okay. I want to I want to talk about that why but okay so what you have these things in place the main thing that you wrote about was income inequality the differences between a Steve Schwartzman or anyone else and I do want to bring in tech people because that's a different kind of it capital. is a different kind of thing explain it, the difference because it's it's equity it, well there, you know one Jeff thing Bezos is, is 164 billion dollars right. because does Jeff Bezos deserve 164 billion well um, you know, in economic sense, he did. And he did create something that created a lot of value for a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about his shareholders. I'm talking about all the people that bought stuff from him mm -hmm. um, at a cheaper price. And so h his firm has been productivity enhancing. And, you know, I don't feel so... Uh, so bad about the fact that he's rich. I don't feel so bad that J.K. Rowling is the is 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 uh, you know one of the richest people in England. I mean, you know, she wrote books. People wanted to buy her books. It's a pretty simple transaction. But you have to ask in a lot of companies when there's a pile of money that's profits. Mm -hmm. You have to say who deserves those profits, and is, does should it all go? to the shareholders and the executives, or should it be shared more widely with the company? Mm -hmm. now, you've got companies here um, that are local, some of which are popular these days, some are not, Google, Facebook. I don't think anyone would say that the super profits that they earn, we can talk about whether, whether about that, why they have super profits, but they do. Um, and they do share them with their employees, and they do treat them well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they don't overcharge their customers. It's a little hard to figure out who their customers are. But the anyway. Russians, but go ahead. But Okay. <laughs> uh, they don't overcharge their customers, and, and, and in many ways, they're good corporate citizens. So it's a little hard to get, for me, to get all upset about, about those companies putting aside You're the only person who doesn't, who doesn't hate tech, but go ahead, move on. Well, uh, this week. but it's different than yes. a company like Caterpillar, Right. Which is doing very well, earning good profits, not the kind that you earn out here, but good profits, is paying its executives high, and is trying to crush its union. Right. All right, that's different to me. Um, in the old days, real old days, people may remember there was this company that was leading, the leading tech company, IBM. Secretaries at IBM got paid twice as much as secretaries elsewhere. The people who ran IBM didn't run it and say, you know what, our company is doing great, but we're only going to pay our secretaries and janitors what they're paid in every other firm, and if they don't like it, we'll hire somebody else. They didn't say that. Mm -hmm. 
That's the way a lot of companies behave today, mm -hmm. the way I just described, right. even though they're doing well. Mm -hmm. And that's the source of a lot of the inequality um, in the country. Now, I want to say that that was the source of a lot of, inequ of the inequality up to about 2005. Since then, the inequality, the, the, the character of the inequality has changed. It's the inequality between people who live in San Francisco and people who live in St. Louis, between the companies that are located here and the companies that are located in St. Louis. So the, the gap that's, that's widened since 2005 is between, just to give an example, the secretary here and the secretary there, or the chief executive here and the chief executive there. Right, right. Rather, so where you live and what kind of company and industry you work in is the kind of equality um, that we've had in the last 10 or 15 so, years. So it's called within group inequality right. as, as to between group inequality. Right. So let's talk about the CEO salary, which is always a hot topic for right. journalists. They love put, putting the lists up, the ridiculous, and then whether they earn that, whether they deserve that. Like you're saying, Jeff Bezos might, may deserve that $164 because he's created all this value. And I don't he, think he, people I, actually begrudge Bill, I don't know, maybe around here they do, but in the East Coast, people don't begrudge Bill Gates his million. He invented something. Right. No, I get that. So we're talking about but, but CEO salaries, because okay. right. they are, there's a few CEO salaries that are pretty high here, like Larry Ellison, I'm thinking there's some others who always end up in the top ranks. But so you're talking, first of all, is the CEO salary problem, and we'll get to the unions in a second, um, uh, the union issues. Um, those have gotten out of line comparatively with the, the whole company. It, essentially, as you're saying, which is an old thing. People have always been concerned about right. that. Because it's, it's a market that is not a competitive market. Right. Most other markets, you know, I'm an engineer or I'm a journalist. Okay, you know, I, I get paid as much as I can get them to pay me. And when do they stop raising my pay? When they think they can get someone as good or almost as good for, the, for something less. Mm -hmm. That's not the way CEO pay is set. Mm -hmm. It's not like... Uh, the board of directors says, well, I don't know, can we get someone as good or almost as good as Larry Ellison for half as much? Mm -hmm. The answer to that is, of course you could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they don't ask that question. They don't think of it that way. They think of, okay, what do the other CEOs have? And our company is a certainly above average company, so he should get paid above average. Well, if everyone has to be paid above average, then uh, the average just keeps moving up. It's the Lake Wobegon problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, they don't, and they don't think about it. And they also say, well, this person is so important, the whole company depends upon him, where there's no other person right. who's so important. Well, anyone who works in companies knows that actually there's a lot of people who are important in the company. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only so well, that's much a, to that's see. actually a tech thing. That, that, you know, the, the, the sort of the Jesus complex among well, believe me, Steve Schwartzman thinks that he only he can run uh, the Blackstone Group, mm -hmm. um, except that you know people are starting things that are as successful as his all the time, who don't have his experience and you know don't pay themselves that much, and they seem to do very well. I, it's just not true, as you say, that uh, that there's only one Messiah here, and and mm -hmm. uh, I've got it. And um, it is the sort of arrogance of, of the people at the top that they think that they're basically irreplaceable. So how do you change that? CEO salaries, essentially. And CEO and top executive salaries, because it's the whole group of them. It, it's hard to change, because it's, it's largely cultural. I mean, again, it largely stems from bad ideas. Right. So, but there's, there, there's a, there isn't good competition um, in, that, in that market. So uh, I don't know whether you, you, you change it. Frankly, I, it's not the biggest problem in the world, um, but I think you know you change it by right. If you ask people, they they think it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and if you ask you know the big shareholders, they don't think it's ridiculous. And it's only when big shareholders begin to think that it's ridiculous that um, mm -hmm. that it will stop. Um, but I do have one proposal in the book, um, which is this: um, th there are certain tax uh, treatments for paying basically bonuses and stock options and, mm -hmm. and a restricted stock to, peop to uh, executives. And we, we might say, okay, you can continue to have that, that favorable stock treatment, but only if you have at least as much money set aside for some sort of employee 
profit sharing plan. Now, a lot of companies out here already do that, so they would pass muster that way. They have to way. in order to keep. But there's a lot of companies outside of, of tech where they that's don't, not Because they're not competing for the talent. They, don't, they couldn't lose them in a second. Right. They, they have the attitude, as I said, right. that if I, can hire, if, if, if I can hire a secretary for less mm -hmm. uh, or any other frontline employee, um, then I'm going to do that. And they don't, they don't deserve to essentially uh, enjoy productivity gains that we realize. They don't in deserve to enjoy the fact that we had a great year. Mm -hmm. um, that, that all that money goes to the shareholder, maximizing shareholder value. That's, that's the big curse. That's what's changed since the 1980s is this mantra of maximizing shareholder value. You know, you take someone like Jeff, Jeff Bezos, right. for years, Jeff Bezos said, <laughs> screw the shareholder. Right. Uh, and his stock went up. Every time he said it, the stock went up more. Right, yeah. Uh, but again, these are more the exceptions that, that prove, uh, prove the Google did the world. same thing. They Google all did. did the same they all, Facebook, they, they, right. all, they all do what they feel like because they, have, they set up their companies where there's a single controlling shareholder. It's not just that. They earn rents. They earn rents. They, they are, to some degree, natural monopolies. Right. Uh, and they won their monopoly, in most cases fair and square, mm -hmm. but they are natural monopolies. The world doesn't really want 18 different social uh, media networks because then you can't necessarily talk to whoever you want to talk to. The world actually doesn't want a million different search engines. They want one that benefits from the fact that everyone goes through it and, and, the, uh, and, and the machine learns every time you make mm -hmm. a, a search mm -hmm. and it becomes a better search engine. Mm -hmm. These things are, for economic reasons, naturally monopolies. Um, in the old days, uh, back in you know the 19th century and early 20th century, we regulated them. We, we said, okay, the electric company, we're going to regulate your profit and your mm -hmm. prices. I think we've learned that we don't have to do that all the time, mm -hmm. uh, although now we're thinking maybe we need to do something about these natural monopolies uh, to maybe make sure that they don't prevent the next challenger from their monopoly from coming along. Mm -hmm. So for example, bad idea to let uh, uh, Facebook buy uh, Instagram. Right. Um, Instagram might have challenged Facebook, yes, might have indeed. been the news Facebook. Yep. We didn't know that at the time. Maybe they did, but we didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. But when, when one of these companies comes along, to me, at least the number one step is to say, you know what, you can't buy anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. um, now they can't. Well, we should have said that to Facebook and Google a long time ago. Yes. And, and, uh, and if we had, I think we would have more more competitiveness going on, right. more challenges. The challenges are not, you know, a company that does A challenges the monopolist who does A. The challenge is a company who does B has a total different approach to solving That's right. the problem. They, so they don't compete with each other. It's so a, it's, it's, it's to d the challenge to displace one monopoly with another mo mon serial monopoly is what's going right. to, what is the kind of competition. Actually, it's not serial monopoly. It's an interesting thing because uh, you, Steve, you may not know this, but I was a young, young, young reporter at the Washington Post and Steve was my boss. He doesn't even remember being my boss, but he was. <laughs> Um, I remember you were there. I don't remember I was the boss at that yeah, point. Yeah, but you but were. Um, uh, and you did a fair to middling job. No, I'm kidding. No, uh, no, you did a good job um, in the business section of the Washington Post. And we covered the Microsoft job part of it, part of the time there and uh, had Bill Gates in a number of times. And that was the, the big monopoly trial. Now each of these companies, and we'll get back to the, the, the solutions we need for these problems you're talking about, but each of these companies now, Amazon, Facebook, Google. I'm going to just use those three because yes. Apple's off to the side and there's plenty of, you know, I mean, they're not, they don't have the same kind of market power. But each of those to me is, they're like, and you could sort of add Netflix in there a little bit kind of, but not really because there's all of Hollywood, um, are like semi-trailer trucks going down a three-lane highway and no one can get past them. And they're not competing with each other and they're monopolies but it's hard to imagine the government being able to regulate any one of them. I, I don't think we need to get to that. Um, right. uh, but for one thing, one of the things that government does w when they do regulate is to regulate the prices. Yeah. So what's the price at Google? I, you know, there is no price. So th these, uh, the economics of these things are so different that we want to be careful about it. We don't want to use the old tools to right. bring it to new the new economy. They, they've been talking about But it. one thing we could do right now is say, you're just not going to buy your way into any industry. You, ca right. you can go into it, perhaps, right. but you can't buy your way into it. What's the difference, though? Amazon's just started to sell microwaves, and everyone in the microwave business is, is vomiting right now, right. essentially. We might stop them. Um, but we might 
could do chairs and not them, microwave. What, what we might say to Amazon, if you wanted to be if, take aggressive antitrust, is to say, look, you can run your own plat, you can run your own platform to sell your own things, but you can't also run the platform for all the other sellers to run. You have to decide what business you want to be on. Right. You, do you want to be the platform for all sellers, in which case you can be in that business, or you can, you know, be in the book business and whatever else you think you're selling. But you can't, you can't be the retailer who hosts all the other retailers. Right. Um, so decide which business, or we'll break it up. You know, we broke up uh, Standard Oil, we could break up Amazon that way. Right, interesting. All right, let's get back to your book. So you have the, 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 you don't think the salaries will change? There's no mechanism? Well, no, it's just not the CEO salaries right. that, that, uh, that are the important. I mean, It's bringing a, up other salaries you know, or giving the, them equity. The, or the, 20, the top 20, you know, the last 20 years have been very good for the Sarah, Kara Swisher. They've been very good yes. for Steve Perlstein. Um, there's a lot of people, there's lawyers and doctors and, and right. engineers. It's been very good for, for, for you know, 10 15 20 percent of the population it's not just the CEOs and they've been not so good for um, right. a lot and and that gap uh, okay. has widened and as I say you know the people in St. Louis have not done very well vis-a-vis -vis the people in uh, in San Francisco right but I mean to me it, it sometimes it feels like at the very top you have the top people who made the most money and some people at the very top are obscenely well wealthy they're just it, it's numbers that are just mind-boggling when you think about right. it. Right, they don't know what to do with yeah. the money. And then at the very bottom, there's, they do actually, I, <laughs> I know a lot, of, they do a lot of things with the money. Yeah. Um, it's one of the, one of these moguls, I was at their house and they have, their, their kid has seven playhouses, <laughs> any of which I'd live in. You know what I mean? Like, so they're all different. One's modern, one's country, one's... Uh, and it, I was sort of like, seven? Like, why seven? Like, why not six or four? Or anyway, so uh, so they have plenty to do with their money. Um, but they did employ people to build them, I guess. Um, so, uh, so you have people at the very top, and then at the very bottom, you have people um, sort of mired in drug addiction, lack of... The education system has let them down, nutritional problems. Like, nutritional problems are very significant. Right. Like, um, of in terms of uh, lack of uh, early education, um, job jobs that aren't they either don't want to do or can't do mm -hmm. or, or because of the drug addiction, and then in the middle you have ev lots of people like these people in the middle who know uh, the t ones at the top they lean into the future the ones at the bottom are terrified of the future and should be the ones in the middle want to lean into the future and yet know it's terrifying and so we're not pulling them up into the into at least the top isn't pulling them up. To well, me. And they know for their children they've got to get better education, but they're also let down by the education system. They're also let down by the nutritional system, all kinds of things. And they're not sharing in the prosperity that That's every right. day at their work they're helping to create. That's right. And, um, uh, and you know, there's a lot of misallocation that, that goes on in this process. So l l let me s start with one, with one concept, which is, we used to say, uh, and this is another thing that the market fundamentalists say, look, we shouldn't worry about inequality of income. All that matters is equality of opportunity. And that sounds very American, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we all sort of, we like that thing. But you know, it's, the truth is that you can't have equality of opportunity. Now, I'm not gonna get all social science -y on mm -hmm. you, but let me just say that what we know from social science is if you take any two random people out in the street, and you compare what they make, the difference in what they make can, more than half of it can be explained by the fact of who their parents were. Mm -hmm. And that is the genes that they inherited, right. the personality that they inherited, you, you'd be surprised how heritable personality traits are. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing is the upbringing, particularly their early years, I'm talking about you know zero to four, mm -hmm. um, all those matter a lot in terms of your success in education and your success, therefore, in life. And we can't, unless we take all children away from <laughs> their parents when they're born and send them to state schools, mm -hmm. we can't equalize that. So we can't say that all that matters is equality of opportunity, and that's what we need to work on. We, we can work on that more than we have, and we can make it more e equal, but we can't rely on that. And at some point, we need to say if you're uncomfortable with the inequality of the distribution of, of income, you have to deal with that directly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I, I, I wanted to lay on the table here because that's one of those other ideas that we embrace that's wrong. So what about the middle class? What about the poor? 
you know, the poor is, is a tough problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we, we've solved some of that by giving people money. And fewer people are in poverty, right? All, all across the well, globe. Well, fewer people are in poverty it, now than in the 1950s. Right, but it's but it's but plateauing. It, it, we brought it down with the with the sorry, we brought it down during the Great Society, but then it's sort of plateaued. Plateaued, right? So if we want to deal with that, first of all, we have to understand that some of that is inherited, and we're never going to deal with it. And so one way to deal with that is to give them more money, mm -hmm. and we can redistribute. But the other thing, obviously, is to, to deal with the distribution of income within firms mm -hmm. uh, and uh, say, you know, maybe we should pay people more. And maybe the reason we don't is they don't have unions anymore because we'll companies got you. really good about breaking unions. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we should have a higher minimum wage. Or maybe we should have mandatory, you know, uh, paternity and maternity leave. And, and uh, maybe we should have a public program of of daycare that's uh, that's free to people right, who are poor. Let's go through each of those, because those are critical things. This first one was maybe we should distribute more. Well, we should. So uh, uh, what I would suggest is some version of UBI. There, there are a million ones. Uh, mine happens to be called, would be classified as a negative income tax. So I would. So that's already it, earned income tax credit. Well, it is like that. What I would call it is a dividend. I would say, as citizens, we all share in ownership of this com country, mm -hmm. which has huge resources. But one of the biggest resources is our system, our economy, and our political system. Mm -hmm. And we all deserve to share equally. So I would send a check to every person in the United States for $3,000 on the same day every year or, or send it to their bank account. And everyone gets it. And then for people who are working, I'd send them another 3,000. Now you might ask, well, why do I distinguish between people working and not? And the answer is because the politics requires that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure morality requires it, but the right. politics requires I'm it. I'm working, why should I give that 3,000 right. after that lazy? Right. Then what I would do is I take that money away from people by raise, uh, who, who earn, you know, I don't know, Hundred uh, earn more than the median income, or 110 percent of the median income, or something like that. I'd start to take that away with higher tax rates. Now you say, well, why would you do that? Why, do, why give it to them and one hand take it away from the other? Because I, it, it would reinforce this notion that we're all citizens, we're all equal, and we're all into this together. And here's what I would do in addition. I'd say everyone gets this dividend, but you, that's the good part. The, the other part of it is we all have a responsibility to each other, and we all have a responsibility to, to do three years of public service sometime in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Could be when you're young, could be when you're old, could be when you're between jobs, lots of different times. But to, to reinforce this idea that we're all in it together and we're all responsible for each other. That feels like Israel a little bit. I mean, that's a government, that's an well, army. Well, can I just say that Israel... Uh, there's a lot about Israel I don't like in terms of their, the way they treat some people who aren't Israeli citizens uh, but, and their neighbors. But there's a lot about Israel that's good, and that's a good part of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I might point out it's a I, very entrepreneurial yes, country. Yes, actually it is. It, it, what's interesting is um, the, the commonality. You're talking about a commonality of purpose. That yeah. When everyone was in the army or everybody was in right. something, they share a common right. thing. And another thing that's gone on is I this sorting, which you know about the big sort, that you know, rich people tend to live with rich people and the kids can tend to go to school with each other and they vacation with each other. Yeah, and there's not that. as much mingling of classes as there used to be. Um, that's a problem that we might at least in a small way ameliorate, if we all do public service together, we might do it with people who aren't like us, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps or the Army or other things we might come up with. Although, you know, God forbid someone gets out of the Army for a bone spur, for example. <laughs> keep it up. Keep up, everyone. Um, so, uh, you know, the middle class, I, I have to say that I take some exception with the idea that the middle class is gone away um, the middle class hasn't gone away. It's, it depends well on off. how you want to define it's less well middle class. Off. It's less well off. It's poorer. You know, it's not even clear that they're that much poorer. Uh, and, and, and this, I sort of, some conservative commentators have a point. When I was growing up, um, people didn't have marble countertops. They didn't, everyone didn't have their own bathroom. They didn't all have air conditioning. Their cars didn't all have power windows. Uh, we didn't have a TV set on every floor. Um, a lot of middle class families have those things now. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they're so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And so when we say that the income of, of the middle class hasn't gone up, 
Um, there's two problems with that. Number one, we, we always adjust those figures for inflation, but if we mismeasure inflation, then we mismeasure the income. And I think that's part of the problem. The second is we, we, we are making a problem by confusing statistics. When we say that the middle hasn't gone up, what we mean is the people who are on the middle, in the middle 20 years ago earn X, and the people who are in the middle 20 years now today earn about the same as X. And we say these people haven't gotten a raise, but they're not the same people. Overall, if you, could, if you do a different, that's, a, that's sort of looking at share of national income mm -hmm. um, and median income in groups that change. Mm -hmm. If you were to actually do longevity studies and look at individual people and what happens to them, in fact, their income has gone up. First of all, they get older, and when you get older, your income goes up. You go up in the ladder, and, and you, you know, go up in the company. So that's one thing that happens. You get more experience and more talent, and you, know, you get paid more. Um, but if you follow them, their income has gone up. Okay. There's a compositional change. Remember, there are people coming into the economy all the time, right. and they can tend to come in at the bottom, and that has, has the effect of pushing everyone up up on their rung right. of the ladder. Right. So statistically, you can't say that we haven't gotten a raise in 20 okay. Some people haven't, so, so but a lot of people So I'm going to go back to the, the distribution. Well, okay. How do you get companies to do that? Now, you, they, ha they do it by because here they have high salaries and the people demand it, and there's a limited amount of talent. Right. And so they get that, right. That's a, a, along with you know kombucha shakes and fresh massages and stuff like that. Like They, they get all the stuff that they get. So you can change things like union rules mm -hmm. and minimum wages. Talk about union, because the, the hollowing out of unions, I think I agree with you, has been... It's been bad, but, uh, but let me just say, you remember I said this started in the 1980s? Well, one of the reasons it started was that unions got piggy, mm -hmm. and they made companies uncompetitive. Mm -hmm. They were paid too much. They were too successful, and the result of that was that jobs went overseas and unions were broken. So they overplayed their hand. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we wish we had them back in the private sector. They still are something of a factor in the public sector, but in the private sector, 6% of employees are unionized. So we need to bring back a different kind of unionism. So what? What would that look like? It would look more um, like a company-by-company company worker organization that has, that has company some by role. Company-by-company. Okay. So there's some not group. It's not, it's not like, uh, you know, the international unions where... W which, right, truckers. Which, uh, I think it probably is more company by company. Uh, it's more collaborative. It may not... It with, the, with management. With management. I don't think it would... It, it, I, I don't think we want to get back where like they start Germany. dictating Germany work is rules. Yeah, Germany is, is... A little more like Germany, but there are some people like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders that want to say every company must do this. I tend to resist that sort of one size fits all. We need a regulation that makes every company do it. Um, we can change anyway. We can change union. So we can change the, the union movement needs to re reimagine itself and re-energize itself. But what it is is employees need to get together at individual firms and say, you know what, we're not going to take this anymore, and we want to sit down with you and talk. Mm -hmm. And and we have this we have this union law that says if you have to follow it this this exact procedure you have an election and if half people do then you're the exclusive bargaining unit and and it's a very rigid kind of uh, formula that was very good for the industrial era it's not good for now right um, so we need to change that but we can't even have a conversation about that these days in Congress you, you and can't. what and what do workers what leverage do workers have in these especially in areas when they can replace you well. Workers, first of all, they have moral suasion, and particularly if they're reasonable and if they come together and they say, we want to work with you, but here's why we're unhappy. Right. Okay? And by the way, if you don't listen to us, you know, we may walk out together. Yes, but then... Or we may far start our own company together, or right. we may actually go through this route that, that they have in the NLRB, and you'll be stuck with a union. So please don't make us do this. Mm -hmm. Please treat us respectfully. Right. Um, and... 
you know, to the degree that people are better educated these days and they're more professional, there are more professional jobs, and to the degree that the professionals in the firm want to feel good about representing also the right. non-professionals in the firm, I think that that can work. Interesting. I mean, again, it works, again, in Silicon Valley, but they, like, they, they don't want to work for drones. I don't want to work for ICE. I want to, like, we have... The Look, we worked in a newsroom and we technically had a union, but that was sort of a joke. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if, if the sort of the senior and uh, more influential people in the newsroom went in and saw and said, you know, you can't treat people like this, whether it's, you know, the, w what you're doing with ours or how much you're making us right or, you know, you're letting some people in who, who aren't really paid a living wage. We, if we had said that to them, I think they would have had to respond to that and it wouldn't have been the union. So then it's not an organized effort. It's not an organized, it's not always threatening if you do this, we're going to go out on a strike. Right. Um, uh, I, I just, uh, I think we... So you don't think they need a hammer to... Well, no, I don't think they need a hammer. But look, on, on Silicon Valley, uh, you know that if the employees get together and say, you know, we could go out and start our own firm. Mm -hmm. um, That's what they do, actually. And, well, they do that, but okay. it, it, they say, we don't really want to do this. We li we'd like to work here, but you right. can't treat us this way. Right. Um, That's because there's a scarcity of talent. Um, but I think it could happen in, in a lot of other places. You know, can it happen in a in a in a in a low skilled McDonald's mm -hmm. uh, franchise? Sudden, yeah. I, I think that's hard. Right. Um, but I, I wanted to get to another point, Kara, which is I don't think actually government is going to be uh, the key here. The Meaning problem overhauling that, union rules. Well, whatever it's union rules or antitrust rules or tax rules, I think you mm -hmm. can use use those to tilt the the system a little bit toward fairness. Mm -hmm. But in the end of the day, it's a matter of social norms. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the, I think the most important point of the book. There was a time in this country where companies would not have behaved that way because it just would have been socially Absolutely. unacceptable. Okay. okay? The employees wouldn't have accepted it. The community wouldn't have accepted it. Uh, and uh, the customers wouldn't have accepted 100%. it. hundred percent. Okay? And we got away from that. And we need to reestablish social norms so, so that customers and, em and employees uh, say, we don't want to work for a company like that, and we won't work. For, we don't it's deal with a company like that. because that's sort of a tall order these days, isn't it? Well, it's a tall order, but, you know, let me just ask you, the Me Too movement? Mm-hmm. That's what that's about is a change of social norm, and it happened yes, pretty. Right. It happened pretty damn fast. Yeah. yeah. And w you know, the other day, Amazon, the company we've been talking about, uh, announced that they were going to not be paying their. Uh, they pay fifteen dollars an hour to employees that they had, in many cases, been paying a lot less than that, yeah. and they had been resisting the idea that they were being unfair. And all of a sudden, after resisting this idea, they're going to pay fifteen dollars an hour, which is pretty. Because they see Washington pretty, coming. Well, but see, they see unions coming, maybe. They see Washington coming. They don't care but here's them. another thing. I think what happened is that there were customers, you know, probably upper middle class professional customers who care about these things, who say, you know what, I'm not going to deal with Amazon anymore because of that. They were getting pushback from customers. And here's another thing I bet they were getting pushback from. Hmm. Young talent, I'm not talking about people who work in the distribution centers, but talent at the executive level, um, who said, I don't want to work for a company like that. See, I don't agree with you on that one. I think uh, Jeff Bezos is a very canny person. He could care less what anybody thinks. Well, he and may care less, but if his executive is I saying, I'm having trouble getting I, computer programmers. I think he was worried about regulation. Well, he was, but you don't think he's worried about uh, people, for, uh, computer programmers who's could, no. who could go anywhere? No, because he lives in Seattle. He has more of a, he has more control. I'm just telling well, you. Well, I tell you, he did not enjoy the fight that he had in, in, in Seattle, in Seattle and not. the political impact. I think he sees around corners and he sees them coming for him. And so he's well, buying the Washington Post wasn't quite enough. So he, well, but you know, you know, his uh, ridiculous service. You don't think there were people in Seattle who said, I don't want to work for that company anymore? Mm -mm. No. Okay. All right. What I do think is that, you know, they're, they're about to announce this, this new headquarters, for example. Yeah. And I think many people are on to the fact that it's a ridiculous goat roadie of a circus. Like, that it, like there'll be 170 cities that we're never going to get this thing right. that we're offering. And then we're going to get it in Washington. Right? You're going to get it in Washington. Right. That's right. That's where it's coming. Because he has a nice house there in Calaram. It's really sweet. Well, that may be the reason. I, I, I actually don't think he should put it in Washington, to be quite frank. Because well, he likes it there. Well, he imagine? likes it, but I think he should put it in Baltimore. Oh, 
Interesting. Which would have been close enough to the house in Calorama. Okay, all right. Uh, good. But good. is a city so we can that is not so expensive and has a and yeah, has right. a it lot be, of problems. It may be Baltimore. It may be Baltimore. He. I well, think Baltimore is not a, is not even a candidate. It's not a finalist. Well, then it will be Maryland and Virginia. You don't think it'll be the district itself? Mm, I don't. He needs a Republican. Anyway, we can go on. It's, like, it's a long story. I'm, gonna, I'm writing a column in the Times about this. Okay. Week. All right. Uh, anyway, let's ask some questions from the audience. We've got about 26 minutes left. Is, C, is Steve Mnuchin a good Treasury Secretary? Uh. No, he's a nincompoop. Okay. <laughs> uh, can you explain nincompoop? It's a technical term. I got that. <laughs> uh, he, you know, uh, here's number one reason. Um, uh, he hasn't been able to, to attract a talented group of people at the Treasury to do some very important jobs. Um, and uh, he's just, you know, he's just a, a kiss ass. Uh, and uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the slightest idea what he's doing. Yeah, well, he's not going to Saudi Arabia today, this week. He's not, he's not, he just, they decided. Yeah, but he was waiting to get instructions on he was. that from the he White did. House. I know that. Can I just tell you, good Treasury secretaries don't wait to get good instruction on that from the right, White House. Right, exactly. They I tell the White House what yeah. we're gonna do. Because this is a gang that has profiles in courage over there now. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. You're so good at what you, did you see that one cabinet meeting? Yeah, I mean, uh, was that embarrassing or what? I, I, embarrassing is, is, a, is a kind term for what that was. Anyway, um, what's the impending bubble should we be concerned about? What is the bubble? Is it a housing bubble? bubble? Is, uh, Stock is, market? Well, it's stocks and real estate and uh, all sorts of financial assets. Uh, mostly, um, uh, it's a bubble in corporate debt. Uh -huh. um, and I don't think you want necessarily want me to go into that, but yeah, um, there's, a, there's a huge, there's been a huge bubble in corporate debt. And, and do, you, do you remember we had these things where they took the, the uh, mortgage loans and they packaged them I and do. they sliced them and diced them? Yes. Well, now that's not such a big market anymore. Uh, uh, but there's now a huge market and growing in business loans of all sorts and corporate loans that are packaged and sliced and diced. And the quality of the loans has gone way down. And uh, uh, the amount of indebtedness that a lot of companies have has gone way up. And these these loans are variable weight, weight loans. Mm -hmm. They started out very low because interest rates were low. As you may have noticed, interest rates are coming up. And yeah. so when the interest rates are reset, these companies are going to have trouble paying, you know, keeping up with these loans, uh, let alone paying them back. And we're going to have a lot of um, uh, debt defaults. Right. Um, there's also a huge bubble in public debt, not just U.S. Treasury debt, mm -hmm. but the debt of local and state governments. We may have a few state government um, uh, uh, essential bankruptcies going on. So we've got a lot of restructuring that's coming. When, and that says nothing about, you know, if the Chinese economy uh, starts to tank or we, or we have problems in, in Europe and with the euro again, which is very possible. Um, uh, all of this stuff is way overpriced. Um, when you say debt is overpriced, most people say, what are you talking about? But this debt isn't just held by a bank. It's bought and sold. And the th these instruments that are bought and sold are way overpriced. Thank God I have Bitcoin. Anyway, should the guy... Well, Bitcoin is another yeah. thing. You know, the I do, I, You know, I had Bitcoin. I did a story on it about six... When it started, and I bought 10 Bitcoin, I put it on one of those hard drives, and I lost it. Well, that's a, that's a bubble that burst, and and well, that's, that's an asset bubble. That's a that's a stupid idiot. But uh, go ahead. Burst, and it may, uh, you know. Yeah. And by the way, do you understand that all of these things, whether it's Bitcoin or whatever, Blockchain. were bought with, with 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 borrowed money that was cheap? When the Federal Reserve tried to get us out of that long recession, they printed a lot of money and they threw it into the banking system. Most of it sat there and did nothing. But what was borrowed tend to be borrowed from people who bought it to speculate in financial instruments like Bitcoin, like real estate, like all these uh, debt instruments that I was talking yep. about. And uh, it's a heavily, uh, it's yep. heavily leveraged. So when, yes. if those things start to go down in price, the people who bought it with that, with that borrowed money have to sell it in order to, to pay back the loan. And when they get into forced selling, forced selling forces more forced selling, yep. forces the price down. We're not going to like the way that looks when it starts. That's probably when I'll find my hard drive with the Bitcoin in it, right when it goes to the <laughs> bottom. Um, should the government have bailed out banks after the 2008 crisis? Yes. Um, 
look, uh, they, weren't, they, they didn't bail out the banks, they bailed out the banking system. Mm -hmm. um, and they bailed out the banking system because we're all better off as a result of it. A lot of innocent people would have been hurt. Lo they would have lost their jobs, their homes, their savings, who had nothing to do with causing uh, this problem um, if, they had, if the banking system had gone down. Um, and by the way, um, uh, the, money, the government got its money back. So when you use the word bailout, as people do, they got paid. Uh, yes, they were bailed out, but you know, we, we, we cleverly bailed them out in a way that got all of our money back. Is it a, is it a bad precedent? Sure. Do some people get, uh, get their, their, uh, their money saved that otherwise wouldn't have who were responsible? Sure. But on balance, the world is better off and, because they and, did And I that. think the third question is, did nobody go to jail? Uh, how does taxation fit in as a method of regulating or controlling affecting extremely high salaries? Well, because you can change the tax law. Let, let me give you an example. Um, when companies spend billions, as they are now, record amounts of billions of dollars to buy back their shares, it's a tax-advantaged way of getting basically the profit of the company to the shareholders in the form of basically their shares are worth more, okay? Um, but we could treat that as the equivalent of a dividend and tax them at the moment in which the shares were bought back, tax all shareholders um, for the increase in the value of their shares. Mm -hmm. Treat it as a, for tax reasons right. as a dividend. And we might say to companies, okay, if you have a profit sharing plan with, uh, that we think is, meets the criteria with your frontline employees, we'll let you treat a share buyback as a, as a, as a, capital, as a capital gain. But if you uh, don't have one, well, we're going to treat it as a dividend. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a way to nudge them in that direction. Right. Uh, use the tax code to nudge them in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we could also have a tax code that's more progressive than it is. So what would I do? The first thing I would do, we got, you know, this Congress got rid of the estate tax. Uh, a terrible idea. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's politically controversial, so here's what, what, what I would say. Uh, first thing is that there's a little loophole in the tax code that all rich people know about, which is uh, if your, your shares have appreciated a lot and you die, then you don't have to pay the capital gains tax on that. Mm -hmm. At death, the people who inherit those shares inherit it at the new basis, and they start out wherever it is uh, when they inherit it, and, uh, and that capital gains tax is never paid. Mm -hmm. As a first step, we should just say that at death, you have to pay the, the capital gains tax. Right. It's not an estate tax, it's just an unpaid capital gains tax. Right. That would raise almost as much as reinstating um, uh, the estate tax. That said, you're dead. Um, so um, that said, you're dead. But it, your heirs yes, should pay that. the tax that you yes. you unfortunately didn't, didn't didn't live to pay. Get around to pay, right? How do you rate California's tax system? Would it work in other states? Um, I, I don't know enough about California's tax. You There's have high taxes here. Yes, we do. Um, but you also have higher incomes. Um, so I would say that. You shouldn't, the one size, there is no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't try to take it and impose it on Alabama. I think that would be a bad idea. Yeah, all right. Um, can capitalism thrive without constantly expanding population? And related, how will aging of society impact American capitalism? Uh, I don't know how to answer the second one. Um, and people in Japan worry a lot about population shrinking. Mm -hmm. Um, and old people too. Uh, I don't actually uh, worry about that that much. If if, uh, but it seems to me that our country has always our model has has is based on growth. Some of that is productivity growth. Uh, some of it is people moving around. You know, we move to other parts of the country, and some of it is immigration. I don't know why we'd want to screw around with a model that's worked f well for us for more than two hundred years. Yeah. What, what's the purpose of that? You might want to. You might want to have an immigration system that encourages certain kind of people What's to come purpose? as opposed to other kinds of people. We could have a conversation about that. But uh, the idea that, that somehow we'll be better off if, if, we, we, if people who want to come here don't come here, um, I don't know, that's loony. Um, Do you, you know. imagine it's, a, it, it's 
they're trying, this is a, a logical argument they're yeah. making. W what the logical argument would be? There is none. It's well, the racial. people who are at the bottom think that all the immigrants have to be people who are going to compete with them for low-skilled jobs. Or um, they're bringing in drugs. I was, uh, I was talking to someone yeah. who, um, who, was in, uh, who was just a reporter who was just visiting a, a shrimp fisherman in um, Louisiana, and they asked what the biggest problem was, and he said terrorism. And they were like, you're not under siege from ISIS in any way. Certainly not in Louisiana. Not on a shrimp boat, for sure. Yeah. Um, and what his, what his idea of terrorism was is that he couldn't hire people to work on the shrimp boat because they were opiate addicted. And the opiates came from Mexico, and so he thought the cartels had created the yeah. drugs, yeah. which had created the opiates, which means he couldn't hire people. So he thought the cartels were terrorists. Yeah. Well, people and think crazy things. Playing into the Donald, that's why it had so much resonance with him. Look, ten percent people believe in UFOs, so you know yeah. you have to start with. Yeah. with, with Although that, that one, I followed part. a lot more quickly. I, I also believe in. Uh, UFOs. But, uh, but uh, you know, the, the thing is, John Podesta. Uh, why, why, why aren't Democrats and 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 the business community um, um, making an affirmative case for, you know, a st steady legal immigration? Um, the question, why aren't Democrats, is a very long one. Yeah. I think we'll be, that's the problem. Um, what's better than capitalism? Better cap. We can have a better capitalism. Better capital, which is yeah. what you talk yeah. about. Yeah. I'm not, a, no one, as you know, no one would ever um, mistake me for a socialist. No. What do you think of this, mo this movement in this country? Well, it's a, it's a pretty good, it's just a good, it's like a poll result. It's a good indicator of how capitalism has has lost uh, lost its appeal, and it, it has a bad odor to it. Do you know that more than half of millennials uh, actually don't support cap say they don't support capitalism? Yeah. And 57 percent of Democrats in a recent Gallup poll said um, that they look favorably on socialism. Now I'm not sure they know what socialism is, yeah, but I know. think it's it's a pretty good indication that people aren't all that happy with our system, and it's not just the people who are, are losing from this system. There's a lot of people like me, maybe like you, who are successful and are doing fine by this system, who also don't like it, who feel that it's lost its moral legitimacy. Um, and I think that's what we're picking up in all of these I think uh, you only have to things. look on the streets of San Francisco to get that. That's why, you know, you see that, the, what's happening here. In, in terms of the homelessness? Yeah. It's, it, I think you'll see it all over the country, but we're, we're always pioneering things here, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> right? Like, it's amazing. But you're going to see it. You sh I, I've just noticed it in Washington recently, in Los Angeles, and it's just uh, Hawaii, everywhere. Um, what, how do we deal with America's shrinking middle class? You said there aren't, especially young people on the student loan problem. Uh, Free college. You know, uh, I think much too much effort uh, and attention is put to, number one, making sure everyone goes to college, and two, the student loan problem. Um, it is a problem um, for a lot of young people um, from the perspective that they have their loans look overwhelming. Um, but we know that because of their college degree, whether that's deserved, by the way, or not, whether they learned anything in college or not, and I say that as a college professor, uh, <laughs> uh, they are going to earn more over their lifetime that makes that um, yeah, uh, a, a fine investment. Um, people, it used to be, the one of the things that used to be in firms, remember I talk about sort of you know, uh, mm -hmm. sharing in firms? One of the sharing that used to go on in, in firms in the old days was that the older employees essentially subsidized the young employees. Because yep. the young employees were basically worthless, okay? It takes two or, Thanks, three, two or three years. No, it takes two or three years to, to learn how to do yep. your job, okay? And we paid them more than they were worth when they were young and then we paid them less than they were worth when they were older. There was, a, there was a more equality, okay? There was more equality of pay. Now we don't do that because there is no loyalty and people don't stay with the firm long enough so you can't, you have to sort of pay everybody what they're worth at the time that they're working with you. So right now, young employees are paid less and so they, they, they don't see how they're gonna pay off this debt. But what happens now is that that, that, that upward slope of salaries is steeper. And so if you wait till you're, you know, in your mid 30s and 40s, you'll, you'll be able to pay it off. Um, but it doesn't seem like that now to them. So you obviously don't believe in free college or free tuition? I don't believe in, uh, free college is the worst way to go, it seemed mm -hmm. to me. Um, 
I just uh, interviewed uh, I Eric what, Garcetti about free community. No, my, my thing is, and it makes me really popular uh, on campus at George Mason University, is to say that we charge too much for college because it's a very inefficient way to, um, to educate kids, and uh, we need to learn to use, for example, technology mm -hmm. uh, to lower the cost of instruction. Right. Uh, There's and some companies out here that are doing well, it. Well, I know, but you should, uh, believe me, I work on a campus, and do you know the resistance of the faculty to this idea? Um, too bad. Pardon? Too bad. Well, uh, if you were a college... You remember Washington Post resisting the Internet? I well. understand, but, yeah. uh, but uh, look, I'm for all the people who want to do this, but, you know, faculties uh, basically control the place, and yeah. they have their own self-interest at heart. Yeah, they'll die. Um, okay. <laughs> Not fast enough. No, a lot of people don't die fast you, enough. Um, is there an ever? <laughs> I just gave an interview where you know you know what the average the average age of faculties are. I know it's appalling. Appalling? What is it? Well, because people hang around and what is it? What's the age? I'd say it's in the sixties. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, is there an ever increasing ev uh, increasing this economic? This is universities with tenure. Right, I'm not talking it. about community college. I'm right. talking about universities yeah, with tenure. Um, is there? An, is ever increasing economic growth sustainable environmentally? Huh, good question. Yes. Why? History tells us it is. Um, yeah. You have to do it right. Uh, you have to use technology to reduce. 100%. The, uh, but, but the idea that, you know, remember people, the zero population, we can't because yeah. the world can't, we have to have no population growth because otherwise there won't be enough resources and mm -hmm. all. It, that, that technology always solves those problems. Yeah, I was just actually at a meeting yesterday with some venture capitalists, and there's a new technology they're working on with that. You know how tomatoes taste terrible when you get them at the store because they've been picked too early yeah. and they, they're hard as rocks and things like that? This allows them to ripen, this technology. You wrap, it's a thing, a wrap without chemicals, so you don't have to use chemicals to do it. It's a certain kind of wrap that they're putting on it that um, you can you can ship them. It's, they're working on it with avocados because avocados are so expensive. Yeah, and they um, go bad so quickly. They go bad so quickly. And you wrap it, and they don't go bad for much like three times the amount of time, which is really interesting because I think it's 40% of food is wasted uh, getting from the, the farm to the, to the store. And so this, is, this could cut that drastically and get you better food at the same time, which I thought was super interesting. And I thought, wow, that would... You know, to get here, you have to fly from Washington. You have to fly over the country. A anyone who thinks we're running out of room. Right, right. That's <laughs> true. That's a fair point. In any case, it was really interesting. It was a really interesting. Um, all right. Could you please discuss the rapidly mounting deficit resulting from the tax bill? Uh, well, it's going to be a problem, uh, okay. and and it's w the reason it's going to be a problem is not because we are going to burden our children with this debt. Uh, Government debt is, at least the federal government debt, is never repaid. It's just rolled over. So your children will never, and your grandchildren will never have to repay it, just as you never repaid the one you know, from World War II. The problem is the interest on the debt. Yeah. Okay? We're taking on all this debt when interest rates are low. When we roll it over, the interest rates are not going to be so low, and interest rates are going to start to take more and more of, of what we pay in taxes. Uh, it'll, it won't be very long before the interest uh, takes, uh, takes more than, uh, than Medicare, okay? And then you're going to have to make hard choices. You're either going to have to raise your taxes, which means you're going to have less money to spend on other things, or you're going to have to cut services one way or the other. But uh, this is going to be a problem, and the crunch is coming in about three or four years mm -hmm. when this high level of debt will be financed at high interest rates. Do you, I'm just curious, do you imagine, because it's in the news right now, the, um, what's happening in Saudi, with Saudi Arabia right now will impact the global fund, because they are fun here, this place is awash in toxic so, so Saudi money, money right now. Well, the, the, the rest of the world is awash in, uh, in That's what uh, I mean. Saudi money too. So it, what's going to happen with this? Well, uh, you know, the world is awash in Saudi money, and if Saudi money doesn't go in one place, it'll go another place, and if it goes another place, and the, one, the money that would have gone in the other place will go to this place. <laughs> money is fungible. I, right. I, wouldn't, I don't, would not say that is a global macroeconomic problem. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, if the, if the Saudi money wasn't coming here, uh, some other money will come here that would have otherwise come here if the Saudi money wasn't here. 
So I wouldn't but worry. But that's the, the amounts are so different. I mean, you have Singapore money, you've got Russian money, you've got Chinese money. Can I just say, I of all the things, all all the the things that you here in the tech right. community have to worry about, not having access to global capital is pretty down, got it, far got down it, on my got list. Got it, got it. But okay. the other night at dinner, all these entrepreneurs were making Right, because it. they're thinking literally, well, well no, I'm getting the money from this buy here. Well, where else am I going to get it? They can't even imagine. But trust me, they'll, someone no, will find it. No, I get it. it. They were debating how dirty the money could be. Like, they were making a list of, of dirty. So Saudi was at the top of dirty money, and I think Singapore was at the bottom. So they're going to move to the Singapore people. Yeah, well. I'm serious. This was a discussion at dinner. I was horrified, and I wanted to shoot everybody in the head. So. Well, let me just give you an example. Um, the money could come from, uh, there's a lot of money that Americans now Not as big as put the in, in U.S. Treasury bonds, okay? Yeah. I'm just saying the Saudi well, money. Well, uh, the Saudis could go buy U.S. Treasury bonds. No one will know who's buying right. it. That's and, right. Okay, point. and the money that used to go into Treasury bonds can now go into, yes. into you, Silicon you Valley. Should do, you should get into global finance, okay, to hide all the money. Um, anyway. Uh, I, and all I said was it's all dirty money, so just take it. Um, large middle class used to anchor stability and moderation. This is the question. How do we grow it enough to counter our extreme polarization? Because really that's a lot of it is about the haves and the have-nots right now. Well, um, yeah, and I think it would be useful if the, if, uh, the people in the mi middle were feeling prosperous because they wouldn't be voting for people like Donald Trump. Uh, um, so how do we do that? Well, I think we've talked about... Um, uh, all the ways uh, that we can do that. I, I don't uh, think we need to give them a tax cut. In fact, you think I'd that's the only reason? I think they came for the feeling not properous, prosperous and stayed for the racism. But um, so. Uh, well, I think probably the different ones came for different reasons. All right, but it, wh what do you imagine the next go around? I'm sorry, I just I have a million of them. What's what what's? What the do you think is going to happen the next one? Because because the economy's never been more healthy right now. So is that going to continue? Is that they anger? don't actually? F if they were feeling that way. Right. then the Republicans would be very happy because it would be showing up in the polls. They're not feeling that way. So the, one of the worst things is for people who don't think they're in, uh, participating in the prosperity to see prosperity and see they're not participating in it. It's worse than if the if economy okay. wasn't prospering. Do you think that continues, those feelings of non participation. Apparently, because if they were feeling that way, then they would be, you know, voting Republican this time. But well, although many think it's just women who are just have had it. That's that, that's what all the stories are written down. I, I don't think that. Okay. Last question. Uh, we have just a few more minutes, and they're all sort of this, uh, together, so I'm going to read them all together. Um, is capitalism short-sighted? What goals should we, ha we should have to improve this? What's wrong with capitalists? Arguably, capitalism is working for them. How will they be convinced to change? And it seems our desires are unsatisfiable. What can we do about it? And what is money? Now, I'm not going to answer that question, but it seems our desires are unsatisfiable. What can we do about it? Those are all kind of linked. Okay, well, I don't know how to answer our, 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 our desires are unsatisfiable. I don't, I, That's the I, human condition. Uh, okay, so that one, sorry. Okay, go, uh, don't the, be human. Be uh, a robot. Go back. Okay. Go back. What, what, what's an early one? What's wrong with capitalists? Are they capitalists working for them? How will they be convinced? How do you convince people to change these practices you think are toxic? I think it has to be through social norms. Okay. I think, I, I'm going to tell, tell you a little story. Okay. In the 1950s, if, an, if any CEO had paid him, tried to pay himself the equivalent of $800 million, he would have gone to the country club, and the other CEOs at the country club would say, cut that out. You're making us all look bad, uh, and you're going to make socialists out of people. Stop doing that. And people who are in that strata now don't do that anymore. No, they say, give me some. Right. They, th they have to, they ha there needs to be a difference in the norm so that people say, this isn't right. And you know, people do say that. Um, for 30 years, we've been told to ignore our moral instincts, that you have to ignore that because in order for our, con our economy to be competitive again, you have to ignore your moral instincts. And we have to now feel free so to say, does that happen? follow how, my, how? I, how would it happen? Because, because, how? because, I mean, all I could say is because Twitter, like because no, Donald it, Trump, because it, 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 ha it happened what, for a lot of reasons. It happened because of corporate takeovers that let Wall Street dictate how, how companies are run. How do you get it back? Run. I'm just saying it just seems to have gotten worse. That how has it gotten yeah. worse? I don't know. How is it that we did Me Too? How is it that that changed? It just happens. And actually, um, 
I, I don't like social media. I'm not on any social media, but social yeah. media actually yeah. apparently makes it easier yeah. to change these norms um, because, yeah. and to shame people. And we need to shame someone who pays himself $800 million a year. Uh, we need to shame people who, you know, who, who pay their employees seven twenty-five and don't give them health benefits and, and give them schedules so that they can't you know, even get their, their, their child care uh, arranged. We, we need to shame those people, and we need to say we won't do business with you, we won't work on your firms, we won't invest in your firms. Then how do you shame politicians into giving parental leave or passing the, the really true okay. things? I, I would say if you, change, companies. if you change the norms, the, the laws will follow. If you try to change the laws to change people's norms, that's not a way to go. You can't do that. You need to change the norms first. We decided as a country that discrimination on race was not acceptable, and then the law changed. It wasn't that the law changed and then the norm changed. Um, social norms are real important to how um, a society works, but it's actually real important to, to how a market economy so works. Where does that start? With people or I with can't companies? tell you. It's a somewhat magic, but it does start with people. People, magic. people, people saying, I'm going to trust my norms and I'm going to start behaving that way and I'm starting to demand the people in my society who I deal with behave that way. All right, final question. Give me one. I'm thinking of one or two companies that do that. I'm thinking Patagonia, some others. Think of a company that's doing that. Well, there's there's a lot of companies that do it, it, it to varying degrees. And one. the thing is, remember, we, we reason for these things from very individual cases. You know, uh, there's nothing, you know, what a, what a dictator says, there's nothing like a good hanging to get people to behave, okay? Mm -hmm. We need to have hangings. We had a hanging of Harvey Weinstein. We had a hanging of Harvey Weinstein, and look how behaviors change. We need to identify some companies that are bad actors. A company that, I'll give you an example, a company that says, I'm going to move my headquarters to the Bahamas so I don't have to pay my, any taxes in the United States. The, to the government of the United States that did the basic research for the company, that educated its scientists, that protects its intellectual property, you're not going to pay taxes to that? Well, that company needs to be shamed um, in a way that Harvey Weinstein was shamed and, and, and shut down. And then you won't, you won't, after that, you won't find too many companies that, that are going to say now, that again. Interestingly, that's something Donald Trump was trying to do with Ford and other companies that were doing that. Well, you know what? Donald Trump, when he started out with this thing about uh, the carrier thing, which was a disaster, I mean, it was, okay, it was yeah. phony. But if he had actually done something real like that, that would have been great because he just shamed them into doing it. He didn't pass a law, yeah. okay? That is exactly what we need, moral leadership uh, from people, mm -hmm. uh, to reestablish moral norms. Um, that, that is exactly what's needed. But unfortunately, he didn't follow through with that. And in fact, uh, in the case of the, in, in the taxes, he gave them all a, a tax cut, uh, yeah. rather than identifying some companies that were doing what were called tax inversions mm -hmm. and shaming them. But I wish he had st stuck on the course he started with because we haven't heard much about that since, have we? No, we haven't. We um, have not. That was, what, that was why he was elected, because people thought he would do that. But then he didn't do that. What a surprise. Anyway, thank you so much, Steve Perlstein. Thank you. Thank you.